Hi everybody. I have just now come across a concept again that is not for the first time in a video somebody made about 1 John 1 9 that is called familial or parental forgiveness. In an attempt to prove that ongoing confession of the believer is necessary for him to receive forgiveness, this teaching distinguishes between two alleged types of forgiveness on God's part. It goes back to William MacDonald, who died in 2007. In the following, I would like to go through an excerpt from his book, Here's the Difference, um, and read it with you, and have a closer look at this teaching to see whether this is biblical. Now, as for the person of William MacDonald, I am not an expert regarding his theology. I do remember, though, reading his book, true discipleship as a teenager when I was a new believer. I do not have the book anymore, but I do recall the depressed feeling it produced in me, a feeling of utterly falling short because discipleship is being portrayed there as an unreachable goal. I quickly checked again and found that MacDonald turned statements of Jesus into doctrinal truths for today. He basically says that to forsake all, sell everything, etc., is what every Christian must do today. I just mentioned in one of my latest videos how I encountered somebody who is a member of a cult that teaches exactly that. Sell everything you have and join the cult. This is supposed to be mandatory for every Christian. Here are a few quotes from an article MacDonald wrote that has the same title as the book. In the introduction, he lists four points that, according to him, are necessary for a person to become born again. The fourth of which is, when by a definite decision of faith, he acknowledges Jesus Christ as his only Lord and Savior. Then he continues to say, true Christianity is an all-out commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Another quote and what is the cost? The cost is everything, all a man has and is. It meant this for the Savior. It cannot mean less for those who will follow him. If he who was rich beyond all description voluntarily became poor, shall his disciples win the crown by some less costly means? And no disciple can be excused if he does not have zeal. If his heart is not aflame with a red-hot passion for the Savior, he stands condemned. You get the gist. Now, above, we've already seen that he holds to a lordship salvation position. Although he does say that one should not make, quote, submission to Jesus as Lord a condition of salvation, he does say the following, the question often arises, can a person be saved by accepting Jesus as Savior without also acknowledging him as Lord? The Bible gives no encouragement to anyone who believes with mental reservations. I'll take Jesus as my Savior, but I don't want to crown him Lord of all. No wonder his Believer's Bible Commentary was endorsed by John MacArthur. MacDonald is sometimes classified as a soft Calvinist. Here are a few quotes of his that definitely show his leaning towards this false teaching. Now that is him. He says, for example, election refers to his sovereign eternal choice of individuals to belong to himself. Or we do not know who the elect are and so we should carry the gospel to all the world. Or the last one, the Bible teaches definitely that God chose some before the foundation of the world to be in Christ. As I said, I do not at all know his theology in detail, but these quotes are rather telling in my opinion. So much for a little background. Now, let's go to the article. 
I have highlighted assertions of his in orange and concepts I see as unbiblical in red. He says, two different kinds of forgiveness are found in the scriptures, and if we are going to be careful students of the word, we must learn to distinguish them. Now that is an assertion of his. We will call them judicial and parental forgiveness, though these names themselves are not used in the Bible. Um, I highlighted this in yellow here, so at least he admits that. To put it very simply, Judicial forgiveness is the forgiveness of a judge, and parental forgiveness is the forgiveness of a father. The first term is taken from the courtroom, and the second from the home. First, let us go to the courtroom. God is the judge, and sinful man is the person on trial. Man is guilty of sinning, and the penalty is eternal death. But the Lord Jesus appears and announces, I will pay the penalty which man's sins deserved, I will die as a substitute for him. This is what the Savior did on the cross of Calvary. Now the judge announces to sinful men, If you will surrender to my Son as your Lord and Savior, I will forgive you. Now, here's right away a heretical statement. Um, we are not saved by surrendering to Jesus as Lord and Savior, but by believing on his finished work. As soon as the man puts his faith in the Savior, he receives judicial forgiveness of all his sins. Again, judicial forgiveness is not mentioned in the Bible. This term isn't. He will never have to pay the punishment for them in hell because Christ has paid it all. The forgiven sinner now enters into a new relationship. God is no longer his judge. Now he is his father. So now we move into the home for an illustration of parental forgiveness. God is the father and the believer is the child. In an unguarded moment, the child commits an act of sin. Then what happens? Does God sentence the child to die for the sin? Of course not, because God is no longer the judge, but the father. What does happen? Well, fellowship in the family is broken. The happy family spirit is gone. The child has not lost his salvation, but he has lost the joy of his salvation. Soon he may experience the discipline of his father, designed to bring him back into fellowship. Um, I make a stop here. First of all, in the video I mentioned, the situation was described as follows. The son appears before a judge for having committed a crime. The judge pays for him and he is free. Judicial forgiveness has been granted. Then he comes home, and the judge, who is his father, punishes him in the family. Now, that would be some strange sort of double jeopardy. MacDonald now uses the word discipline instead of punishment. Now, this is an assertion of his. Of course, the Bible does say that God disciplines his children. However, MacDonald makes the claim that the underlying reason is sin, and defines discipline as a punishment for sin with a goal to make the child realize his sin and confess it. In Hebrews 12, verse 10 and 11, it says that discipline is for our good and that it is a training. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Not as punishment for our sins. If that was the case, we would be in fear of such punishment as 1 John 4, verse 18 points out, where it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves, or has to do with, punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. There is no more punishment for our sins, because Jesus bore it for us. If we still think that, we are not perfected in love yet. Even if, as the Bible says, discipline is not always pleasant. It is a training for us and not to be seen in a context of sin and punishment. In the next sentence, MacDonald explains what the goal of such discipline is in his view. He says, As soon as the child confesses his sin, he receives parental forgiveness. Now, I have expounded on that in my first John 1 9 video, 
so I won't be going into detail here anymore. The act of citing one's individual sins is not what assures us forgiveness from God. We have already been forgiven the moment we acknowledged, that is, the meaning of confess our sins. The verse is talking about unbelievers who receive that forgiveness from God the moment they agree with God's judgment about themselves and put their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. MacDonald, however, comes up with his distinction here, which is made up, not supported by scripture, and results from the assumption that verse 9 is talking about believers. He says, Judicial forgiveness takes place once for all at the time of conversion. Parental forgiveness takes place every time a believer confesses and forsakes his sin. Not only is he wrongly interpreting the Greek term homologeo confess here, he also adds works to it by claiming that forgiveness is only granted based on a believer's forsaking of their sin. This is what Jesus taught in John 13. Um, that's talking about the washing of the feet. And he says, we need many cleansings throughout our Christian lives to give us parental forgiveness. Again, there is no forgiveness we have to be granted in an ongoing manner throughout our lives as Christians. It has been granted once and for all. As I said, he is referring here to Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and says that this means we have to be continually forgiven. This is a picture of Jesus' high priestly ministry he is currently fulfilling on our behalf. He is our advocate and defends us against the accusation of the accuser of the brethren. The Bible does speak of a cleansing, however. We read that in Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So here we see several things. Jesus is our high priest. We are supposed to come forward confidently and in full assurance of faith. The entrance to the holy place is not blocked by our sin. There is no more veil. Jesus is the new and living way. The only means to enter is by the blood of Jesus, not an act of confession, that is, citing one's sins or by any other action performed by us. We are indeed in need of a sprinkling, but what needs to be sprinkled? Our evil conscience that prevents us from coming forward. This is not to say that we are not aware of our sins. We agree with God's judgment concerning them, but also agree with the means he has ordained to have access to him, and that is the blood of Jesus. However, it is important to note that we do not come to the Lord in order to obtain, whether you call it parental or whatever, forgiveness, Rather, we come on the grounds that we already have been forgiven completely. The pure water refers to the word, see Ephesians 5, 26. Our minds get renewed and we repent, that is, change our mind, wherever we find that it does not align with what the word reveals. In this respect, the word constantly cleanses us. Now, let's continue with the article. The difference between the two types of forgiveness may be summarized graphically as follows. Now, he has this chart here, where he distinguishes again between judicial and parental forgiveness. Down here, for example, he says that the means of forgiveness in the parental half here is confession, which is not true, and that that would grant us parental forgiveness and renew the fellowship and 
that that would be needed many times. So that is what he claims. From now on, when we come to verses that speak about the once for all forgiveness that is granted to us as sinners through the work of Christ, we will know that the subject is judicial forgiveness. Well, that is his claim. The following illustrate this. And then he quotes three verses that speak about the fact that clearly we have been forgiven already. Then he goes on to say, however, there are other passages of scripture that deal with preventive forgiveness. Now, before even looking at them, and they all talk about we can only be forgiven if we forgive others. Let's have a look at where all these passages come from, from the Synoptic Gospels. And that is no surprise there. He already based his whole book of true discipleship on them. Jesus is making these statements to Israel at a time when the law was still in effect and before his death, burial and resurrection, which would bring about a whole new reality regarding the basis and nature of forgiveness. While it is of course true that we as born-again believers are called to forgive one another, this is not the basis on which we are being forgiven today. Nor was forgiveness something that could be earned before for the cross that could be earned, redemption was always based on faith in the Messiah. What Jesus is doing here, and during his ministry on earth, is to point out the various ways people fall short of meeting God's standards, as detailed in the law, and draw attention to any kind of religious hypocrisy. This also showed the people the utter need of salvation. But Let's compare these statements from the Synoptic Gospels with what the Bible has to say about forgiveness post death and resurrection. Colossians 3 verse 13 says, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you must do also. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgive, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So, here you see the new reality. We are asked to forgive as God already forgave us, not in order to receive forgiveness. Now, MacDonald goes on to say, Notice that in two of these verses, God is specifically mentioned as Father. It is the Father's forgiveness that is involved. Now let's stop right here. Um, of course, Jesus is talking about the Father here because he had not yet died um, and atonement had not yet been made through his death uh, and resurrection. So, of course, he could not be talking about this at that point. Notice also that our being forgiven depends on our willingness to forgive others. That is not true of judicial forgiveness. Willingness to forgive others is not a condition of salvation, but it is true of parental forgiveness. Our Father will not forgive us if we don't forgive one another. Now we have just covered that and read the verses post-death and resurrection that state otherwise. Then he tells the story of um, the slave that had been forgiven and is unwilling to forgive others. And he says then it is sin to have an unforgiving spirit and God cannot forgive us parentally until we confess that sin and forsake it. Again, neither confession or forsaking sin is a condition for being forgiven by God. He then concludes one of the thrills of Bible study is to see these basic distinctions and to be able to apply them in our daily reading. From now on, when you come to the subject of forgiveness in the Word, you should be able to say, oh yes, that refers to judicial forgiveness, or else that must refer to the Father's forgiveness of his child. So, no, do not heed this advice, because the supposed distinctions are not there, rather they are made up. 
Now, I have read quite some text of somebody's theology that is wrong, and I do not normally do that. However, I think it is important to know about false interpretations in order to be able to spot those when one comes across them, and they can and should of course be used to find out from the word why they are wrong, and by studying what the word actually says, we become more assured of God's salvation, and in this particular case, about the fact that we already are completely forgiven in an unqualified manner. I hope this has blessed you. Talk to you next time.